Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Peach Planet Podcast. Jason Pye, joined by Scott Turner and Buzz Brockway. Yo. Buzz Hello. Buzz sporting the, the, the old school Braves batting practice jersey. Yes, an old school Braves jersey. <laughs> and Scott and I not sporting anything Braves at all, which makes it a little screwed up. Well, I got my little, <laughs> my little sign. Uh, unfortunately, for you guys who are listening to the audio can't see <laughs> my sign in the background. A little homage to Jock Peterson. <laughs> yes, Jock, Jock Peterson, who, who wrote uh, a piece... Uh, I forget the name of the the publication um, uh, where he he wrote that we might just be those motherfuckers. <laughs> Play, Players well, Tribune. I, I, Players just Tribune. for Players clarification Tribune. purposes, that's not exactly what the sign yeah. says. Scott Scott's being a, being being a wuss, and it just we might just be. Uh, so, but uh we're, we're here we are 30 seconds into the peach planet podcast and we're already in the profanity uh so just just want to know uh scott had texted me this morning and said hey jason we need to get the podcast up on spotify it took me all of 10 minutes to get it up on spotify and so oh, wow. we are we are now live on well not live but we are now on spotify you can find the peach planet podcast on spotify and i also took the Thanks. moment to try to get us on google uh google podcast too so working on that still uh, but we are we are now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, and we'll soon soon be on Google Podcasts. So uh, we are t- slowly taking over the world. And yes. we here at the Peach Pundit Podcast listen to you, our our faithful listeners. That was a text message from one of our Capital Insiders saying, "Why aren't you on Spotify?" And ten minutes later, literally, we on had Spotify. that rectified. We so we aim to please. So when you when you contact us and say. We should be doing things better. We we take your feedback. Notice note itself when a listener reaches out and says Scott needs to go. It just needs to happen. No question. <laughs> I, I'm I'm responsive I, to. We're a market driven podcast. We believe I, in the free markets and we're. Yeah. I mean, I have I've lived with the sword of Damocles over my head in other instances of my life, and it's a comfortable feeling for me. Uh, so, I don't know about you guys, but I lost my mind on Tuesday. I yeah. can see that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. congratulations on the long suffering Braves fans and their world yes. championship. Uh, yeah, it, you know, awesome. it, it is awesome. Um, I lost my mind on Sunday night at the world series when I was there and Adam Duvall hit a grand slam. I mean, and, and, we saw video proof of that. <laughs> yes, 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 we did. And I, I just want to point out that Scott is a bad luck charm because Scott was there and we lost. That's yep. not um, true because I have been to far more Braves wins than losses. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's not on me. That was on Snicker leaving a guy in for far too long. And, but, and but you oh. were there, you were there when it counted. And that speaks, that says, that says, uh, that speaks for something. But well, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I will never go to another Braves world series game. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Your wallet will thank you. Uh, but, Buzz, Buzz, you were out of town, correct? Yeah, I was in Washington. Yeah, well, like, uh, I guess, hotel we were in in alexandria virginia so uh happened to be in a in, in a bar with some of our colleagues we, we were up there for some meetings with some other state think tanks and uh some folks from texas were with us and uh a couple astros fans and so uh we weren't too obnoxious but uh it was it was quite a night and you had both the best of both worlds being in virginia watching the elections watching returns election and in a, a world series at the same time yep but it was it was amazing. I mean, it was it was really, I mean, just an unbelievable run. And to think that they did this without Acuna and Soroka and Azun Ozuna, you know, key pieces that you, you know, you thought would have been there at the beginning of the season weren't there, and then lose Morton in the first game of the of the World Series, and which necessitated the back to back bullpen games. But then Max Fried, I mean, that moment when Max Fried got stepped on in the front. You know, in the first inning, you're thinking, yeah. how did how did he not sprain sprain or break his ankle there? And then he that that just seemed to light a fire under him where he just you know screw this man, I am I am I'm not going to take it anymore. And not only that, down. but Michael Brantley was out on that play. I mean, he, yes, he was he yes, was he out was. and they I, didn't I, challenge. I, yeah, I, w- I will say this. I will say this. I did not get a good look because I, I it, the way it looked was. Free gets stepped on. Michael Brantley didn't touch the bag. You, the bag moves presumably because Free put his glove on it. Yeah, he slapped it with his. But glove. I didn't see. Yep. I didn't. I didn't ever see a replay that showed that. Oh yeah, there was one. There yeah, was they, one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They actually, it was like in the third inning or so when they were doing a flashback because at that okay. point Freed was doing really well and they showed the full clip of 
of him. Yeah. yeah um, slap in the bag. And I think I would, the Braves were just, they were, I think they were all holding their breath as to what's going to happen to freed and forgetting about, you know, whether they should appeal the uh, appeal, the play or not. So, right. No, they should have appealed. I mean, they, if they had that angle, they should have appealed the play, but at this, I mean, I don't know, but uh, I, I, it was exciting. I was working until like, I guess the top of the third inning when, when um, Solaire cranked that three run home run. <laughs> and then I stopped working. Well, I, well, I wasn't so much stopping working. I more started paying a little bit more attention to the game. And uh, I was texting with a, with a buddy of mine who's, who's out in Utah and said, uh, he, I was like, man, I'm not even wearing a jersey tonight. It's like the first game I, I haven't worn a jersey while watching it. He's like, go put the one that you wore last or wore when they won last. So I went on and threw on my 1983 Dale Murphy, uh, you know, the baby blue jersey. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was because I wore that one, I think, on during game four. So, uh, and then and sat, and once I finished work, I think I finished work bottom of the third or top of the fourth and sat down and watched the rest of the game. And I absolutely lost my mind when we won it all. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I can imagine for uh, Braves fans who've been suffering for, you know, two decades, that it was, it was a, an appropriate time to lose your mind. So, yeah. Good work, Braves. Bring Freddie back if you know it's good for you. Well, I want to get to that in just a second, but I did go out this morning because, um, because uh, you know they had the special edition of the of the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So I yep. went out. So I went out yesterday. Couldn't find it anywhere uh, because they weren't selling it. But this morning, Publix had one. But Publix was limiting it to one per person. Uh, yeah. So um, and I went to Kroger instead and got a couple. I got a few more. And the reason I got so many, I got two for myself because I plan on framing the front page of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I got, I got, I think I got four more at Kroger because Kroger wasn't limiting them. It's because yesterday, yesterday while I was at Publix, there was a woman who came in. There were about five or six of us waiting because they AJC said it'd be out early afternoon. So we, there were people already there when I got there. And there's this lady who showed up and she drove from Augusta oh. to Covington to try wow. to, to try to get some. She wanted three. Well, wow. and, and I looked at her and said, I got to drive through Augusta on the 14th of November because I'm going to be going to Washington, D.C. Just give me your number. Tell me how many you want and I'll buy them for you. Oh, aren't you a so, nice guy? So they didn't I, she, They didn't bring them yesterday. So I texted her and said, hey, look, I'm going to get up in the morning and go go back to Publix and get them. Texted her. I was like, look, they all, I told her what happened at Publix. Only one per person. I went over to Kroger. Like three of us who left Publix went to Kroger. We all <laughs> we saw all saw each other there. <laughs> and I, I grabbed four more and uh, paid for them and texted her. I was like, I got them. You're good. I'll see you on the 14th sometime late morning, early afternoon. I'll bring them to you. Uh, don't worry about paying for it. Cause you drove, you drove like 95 miles to, right. to, to get that's this thing anyway, a committed fan. I mean, yeah. that's wow. <laughs> well, she, she said that the AJC doesn't deliver out. They don't do the AJC in Augusta anymore. It's only the Augusta Chronicle. That's the only paper they get out there. Oh, so wow. I felt horrible for her. So I was like, let me just don't worry about it. It's, it was, well, it was, yeah. it was $9. I, I'm sure I, I got that. I'm sure Greg Bluestein is grateful that you're helping keeping him employed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, but apparently the AJC, uh, they're doing also for fans who didn't get this uh, or people who want memorabilia, they're doing like apparently a limited supply. You can drive through, get them cash only. They have details on that at the AJC's website. So, uh, but, but no, you're talking about re-signing at all, all signs. You know, we can bask in the glory of a world championship here in 2021, but 2022 seasons right around the corner. And there are a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, the Braves yeah. had, the Braves have re-signed Charlie Morton, I think yep. for, I think for two years, but I think there's one year guaranteed. I don't remember if the second year was a, was an option or not, yep. uh, but Freddie Freeman, you know, he's going to come out and he was making 20 plus million. He's probably going to command a little bit more. He might, I'm sure he'd give a hometown discount. He wants to, he wants to play as a, uh, his rest of his career as a brave, but uh, Darno. Uh, Smiley, Solaire, Rosario is a big question because Solaire and Rosario yep. were heroes of the NLCS yes. in the World Series. Yep. Smiley, Smiley, peace out. Bye. Yeah. You got, you got, you got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but you know, we, but you're looking at you're looking at the the list of free agents, and uh, it's going to start racking up pretty soon. Well, pretty listen, I, if you're a Braves fan at this point, this is an Anthopolis you trust, right? I mean, the guy's got he's got the magic touch at the moment. I'm sure he'll figure it out. It's a matter of whether or not the ownership wants to give him the resources to do what he needs to do. You know, I, Freddie, Freddie is going at this point. It's in his, it's in his 
hands as to whether or not he wants to even try to resign or if he wants to go test the waters. And I can guarantee you that with Anthony Rizzo going and Stephen Vaught at first base for the Yankees, that they're definitely going to at least run some things by his agent. Yeah. Oh, that that's probably already happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, I guess you, he, they have to wait for him to become a free agent before they officially do it. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But what, I mean, you know, what happens like the, the, the cousin of, of some guy in the organization mentions to one of Freddie's cousins sure. who says, Hey, uh, you know, <laughs> so-and-so is interested. Right. But, but no, I mean, it, I mean, that, that uh, yeah, I mean, I think I was listening to 92, nine, the game this morning. I mean, there would be a fan revolt if the Braves are unable to sign Freddie Freeman. Yes. I mean, I think, look, you, you know, you want them all because obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, Soler and Rosario were key parts of this run here, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting because you, you're going to have Acuna back yep. and you've got four other outfielders. Yeah. yeah. Well, Five Peterson's on a one-year deal. Uh, Peterson was on a one-year deal with he's, uh, he's incentive gone. laden. Yeah. So he'll be, he'll, he won't be coming back unless he takes a huge discount and another incentive laden deal as a guy off the bench. Um, but Soler is, was not doing great until he came to the Braves and he filled some holes for the Braves, but he wasn't yep. doing great. I mean, it was a 192 hitter when the Braves traded for him. So he's been struggling and I, you shouldn't fall in love with a guy just because of a short term, yeah, a short term uh, run of success. He took he hit two, he hit two sixty nine with the Braves, which and hit uh, fourteen home runs. So he had twenty seven home runs on the season. That's that's nothing nothing to shake a stick at. But at the same time, like he's never been someone who hits for average. But you don't really need that in a lineup where you have Acuna, you have Freeman, Freeman, because uh, and as well as people who also can hit like Albies and you know a couple others. Right. Uh, but the question, the biggest question mark, I think we all have is whether Ozuna comes back and, and because yeah. is he, oh, no, be, he's not coming back. Is he going to be, oh, susp- well, where the Braves are still on the hook for his salary. Cause he could be yeah. suspended for yeah, a year. They'll, they'll cut him and they'll, they'll exercise a clause in his contract that lets him get out. If he gets arrested for beating his wife. My understanding and, was he didn't have that clause in his contract. He didn't have oh. a care, a character clause. Well, okay. Well, well, I mean, shame on shame on the Braves then for allowing their players to beat their wives, I guess. <laughs> Way to ruin the World Series, Jason. Good job. <laughs> but the, so the Braves right now going into next year have uh, 54, not including Charles, Charlie Morton's new contract, $54.8 million committed uh, going into next year. So, uh, but, you know. Uh, well, the Dodger, Dodgers are like 260 or something crazy like that. Yeah. So, I mean, look, Liberty, this is this has been a problem for the Braves. That's why, you know, why was Adam Duvall not brought back, for example, last year? Because the Braves didn't have the money because Liberty Media wouldn't give them the money. But there was some in, in, encouraging earnings reports to, that came out today that Liberty Media said that the Braves made, I think it was, I might have the number wrong, $243 million yeah. in the last half of the year. Yeah. So yeah. time to shovel that some of that money into well, salary. The other thing I'll, with, when we haven't even talked about Duvall because he has a 2022 mutual option. So if, if both accept, I mean, I think he's three to it's three to 5 million. I can't tell which, so he could come back too. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not a fan favorite favorite, like Acuna or, or Freddie Freeman, but fans still like him. Oh yeah. He, he could hit the ball a mile. Okay. You know, in yep. case, in case and we've key, forgotten and key points. I mean, he and, was yeah, clutch yeah. and played, you know, being asked to play center field, which is not his natural position and played it pretty well yep made had an unbelievable catch uh robbing at least extra base hit maybe a home run against the dodgers out in uh chavez ravine so and one mm-hmm. other thing one other thing we're not talking about too and, and i want to we'll move on is a lot of these guys who who are arbitration eligible are going to command higher contracts next year too so like mentor and uh luke jackson and some others yep. you know they're going to get paid they're going to get paid more and that's going to add up very quickly so yep yeah, Braves, Braves are going to have to spend money if they want to repeat. So, But this, um, you know, uh, Terry McGurk was saying this, you know, they <clears throat> this should be, they hope, will be uh, the first of many. The, the Braves, there's no reason with this young core that they have, there's no reason why the Braves should not be in the hunt for the world title for a long time. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. And speaking of clutch, also Dansby Swanson being yeah. not, not, not really doing a lot in terms of, you know, OPS during the season, but coming up clutch when we needed it. 
Yep. Um, you know, that was his defensive play, uh, minus a couple of, a couple rough plays was stellar. Yep. So, um, in other big news this week, more political in nature, uh, Virginia apparently run, runs on Yunkin. Uh, oh, <laughs> boo. That's the, that's, that's what they're, that's, Holy that's cow. That was bad, dude. No, you that, don't even no, have no, kids. And that's, that's like an epic dad joke. No, that's, that's what, he, that's what his campaign, that was their slogan for the campaign for Virginia. <laughs> I would have voted for somebody else just because of that. <laughs> Were you going to write it? Were you going to vote for McAuliffe? No, I said somebody else. I didn't say McAuliffe. <laughs> Who's the libertarian that ran over there? I don't think they had a libertarian in the race. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. There yeah, was a they, third party person that, with an unusual name. I looked that up. That Prince, was... Prince is something. Prince is yes. something. Yes. That's my guy. Girl. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't assume his or her or they's gender. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. But uh, Well, if you need a virtue signal, go on. Yeah. I mean, I'm just being, I'm being, <laughs> there is one ask. There's a couple of aspects of woke culture. I don't like that is one of them. Uh, so uh, all that, all that said. So, but no, uh, young kid beats, beats McAuliffe. Uh, I mean, it was initially looking like a blowout, but obviously some areas of the state that are more friendly to McAuliffe did eventually report in. I think, I think young can won by what one and a half, two percent. Buzz, is that right? Yeah, but a little over 2%. A little over 2%. So, yeah. I mean, but it was a tremendous victory. And obviously the things that propelled them uh, to, to this huge win, uh, education was obviously the B issue, the core issue in the race, the last, what, month and a half, if not, if not, well, maybe, maybe roughly month and a half. Uh, that was a big one. There was a lot of, there was a really interesting Washington Post story that came out where people, uh, voters were complaining about COVID restrictions, how they're tired of COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. Economic concerns were another big part of it. Uh, so those three issues together, taken together, really propelled Yunkin to, to beat McAuliffe. And of course, uh, the Republicans also took over the Virginia House of Delegates, which uh, the, the Virginia Senate is still controlled by Democrats. It's a very narrow margin. I think it's 2119. Uh, but Republicans now have a slim margin in the House of Delegates or will have a slim mar margin in the House of Delegates beginning of next year. So uh, Buzz, you had a really good post uh, about the takeaways from from that race uh, over at uh, at the mothership peachmonday.com. Uh, what do you, what are you reading into what happened on Tuesday night? Well, what I was writing about was what what lessons should Georgia Republicans learn from this, and I, I think I think there's several that were very interesting. Obviously, you know every state is different, and there were things that happened in Virginia, unique situations to that that won't necessarily play out in Georgia. Like for example, I don't. You know, McAuliffe was just a bad candidate <laughs> and you can't count on the, you know, he, he made missteps. He tried to, you know, make the race all about Trump when, you know, and Youngkin was just saying, well, here, let me talk about things that you care about. I don't know that you can count on, um, you know, Georgia Democrats being that dumb. Uh, you certainly can't assume that they might be, but you can't assume that that's going to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think, you know, there were a couple a couple of key things. Yunkin talked about issues that people cared about. He talked about, you know, uh, Jason, you mentioned the top issues. According to the exit polling, jobs and the economy was number one at like 34%. COVID was about 17%. Education, 14%. Uh, the, those who ranked education and jobs as their top issue, they, those folks went pretty heavily for Yunkin. So he was talking about issues that the voters wanted to care about, want, or voters cared about. Uh, he wasn't running around talking about how the election was stolen and how Donald Trump felt about things. Uh, Donald Trump, they kept him at bay. And Trump endorsed him, but uh, Trump was not out, was not holding rallies there, was not campaigning there. Trump, uh, you know, eventually had like a secret little phone call with certain key supporters, and now he's running around taking credit for Yunkin's victory, but. He had nothing to do with this. And I right. think that so I think that shows that should show Republicans. Uh, and, and also the, the data shows that Yunkin was successful in uh, attracting back some of the suburban voters that Republicans had lost. Uh, and he, he also performed at the same time, performed very well in areas where Trump had been strong two years ago. So he, he threaded the needle quite uh, deftly. Yeah. And I think it should show Republicans in Georgia that you can win, you can thread that needle, because we have similar problems here in Georgia where the, the divide between rural 
and suburban voters is great. How do you thread that needle? Yunkin's kind of showing you the way. Talk about issues that people care about. Don't talk about grievances and, and the stolen election and so forth. And also, turnout was very high. Turnout was the highest in that governor in uh, in the gubernatorial year since, since about 1997, I believe, is what the data showed. So Republicans tend to be scared about high turnout. Uh, there's no need to be. You, you right. win it on the issues. And there were still more, a higher percentage of, of uh, absentee or votes were cast via absentee by mail than uh, 35% or so. That's, that was higher than it was here in Georgia in, 20, uh, eight, in 2020. So we don't need to fear absentee balloting. We don't need to fear the stolen election and the machines being rigged and all this kind of crap. Get out there and talk about issues that people care about and education being right at the top of them. I and you hit on it, uh, Jason, education, Republicans need to embrace that. There is, uh, there is a revolt happening out there among parents and it's West Cantrell has a bill sitting right there that will answer that question for you, jump on it and run with it and pass it and win this thing. Right. So I'll make a couple of quick observations before, before I turn over to you, Scott, but the, 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 the couple of quick observations, the first one was uh, Democrats are basically def- are, are, are saying, well, Republicans are racist. They managed to play to, they managed to play yeah. to that racist element. It's I think, and, and certainly like the, the focus on CRT at the federal level is lending some to that. And I don't like CRT, but at the same time, at least I understand CRT and do think that there are some elements that are worthwhile, not to say I agree with any of it or, it, or, or all of it. Uh, the, the other, so, I mean, but McAuliffe very clearly said that parents shouldn't have any say in their kid's education. That's, yes. that's arrogance. And, and he parent, doubled down on it until right. it was too late. Right. Yep. And, and that's, that, that does not, that is not going to get a good response from, from, no. uh, from voters who are parents who have kids in public school. Right. Um, and not everyone like Terry McAuliffe can afford to send their kids to a private school. Right. <laughs> and because I think Terry McAuliffe sent four of his five kids to private school. Yep. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I also think that, and, and, and Scott, I do want to get your take, not nationally and in Georgia, but I want to focus on some comments that Kevin McCarthy made this week. Because McCarthy's saying now that, you know, it's not, it, you know, it, they could win 60 plus seats just like they did in 2010. Because in 2009, Bob McDonald's win in Virginia was a precursor to a huge turnout in the 2010 election that swung the House uh, to Republicans, a 63, I think, seat pickup. Uh, but I do, I do think McCall or McCall uh, McCarthy is getting a little ahead of, ahead of himself because I do think the quality of candidates is going to matter. So if you nominate someone who is crazy, like Amanda Chase, who is now running for Virginia Seventh District against uh, uh, Abigail Spanberger, she will get her ass kicked. Well, I think this is a perfect segue um, into what I kind of want to talk about, and and that was starting with the nominating process in Virginia. You know, Virginia, uh, the Republicans decided to go with something, a concept called ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting, and the Democrats did not. The Democrats largely are bemoaning their choice of candidates today because, uh, you know, the people who were just familiar with Tilly McAuliffe's name are the ones who nominated him. They didn't really do much homework or, or they weren't very well educated, whatever. So the Republicans, on the other hand, in Virginia, used instant runoffs, meaning that they ranked their candidates in order of preference. And they did not actually have an open primary. They had a, uh, a convention system um, where all the votes were cast on the same day. And the way it worked was you were pulled into a parking lot, you showed your ID, you got uh, your ballot. Uh, they made sure you were a registered voter, and, and then you participated in this convention process. The convention was held across the state simultaneously, all on the same day. Uh, so you drove through the parking lot, you got your ballot at the beginning of the parking lot, you ranked your choices for each of the races, and then at the end of the parking lot, you dropped your ballot in the box. And then it was taken back to a central location where uh, I've actually spoken to the person who oversaw how all the different rounds were done. And so they, by using that method, they were able to nominate a, a political outsider, a conservative Republican, electable, normal human being, right? right? And, and so Amanda Chase, who ultimately placed third, she was in the running the entire time until the final round. She was there and she has this really, you know, you, you mentioned that she's, what were the words you used a second ago? um crazy 
Well, was I, that the word on, on Twitter uh, earlier today? I said batshit crazy, but yeah, okay. Uh, so that you get the idea. I don't know who she is. I've never met her, but I, uh, I have, some of the have, things that she's known for are making really crazy comments about uh, about how patriotic people were on January sixth and. Uh, support for overturning the 2020 presidential uh, uh, election. She's a, a, she has affiliation with, I mean, just read her Wikipedia page. You'll get an idea who Amanda Chase is. But here is the lesson for Georgia right here is in Amanda Chase personified. I can point to parallels between Amanda Chase and certain activists that we have that serve in the Republican Party here in Georgia. And I think you all know who I'm talking about. She who must not be named is not the other she who must not be named. Amanda Chase sees the results and she says, I accept this. I'm not going to question it. And you know what? Glenn, Glenn Youngkin has my support. And he was able to solidify the, the entire Virginia Republican Party establishment, grassroots, uh, rabble rousers, Trumpies. everybody. Yep. He pulled them together and they solidified behind him. And that built the foundation for his ultimate victory. Now, there are a whole lot of other things. Was, was ranked choice voting the reason why? He, no, it wasn't. It's one of the ingredients in that cake, but it is a very important one because they got a, a candidate that could win that they nominated and ran on issues. The second thing is Republicans and Democrats are not the same. They're not the same. There are a lot of people, and for many years, a lot of people said, I can't tell the difference between a Republican and a Democrat. And when it comes to the issues that are most important to the average American, should your parents have the right to have a say in their children's education, as a, an example, there is a big disparate difference. You can't, you can't deny that there's a big, bright line that draws the difference between the Republican and Democratic parties. So the big thing here is, if we focus on the issues that, and our message of economic freedom and liberty and expanding constitutional protections and making sure that you have the opportunity to live the American dream, these are not platitudes to us. These, this is our platform. If we can articulate that in a way that focuses on that and ignores all the other stuff, because while the media and certain talking heads were calling Republicans in Georgia racist and white supremacists, at the same time, through that same process I just described, we got Winsome Sears, mm -hmm. the lieutenant governor, an African-American woman immigrant veteran. Did I check all the boxes for all the different categories? African-American woman immigrant is now the lieutenant governor of the state of, or sorry, Commonwealth of Virginia. So it wasn't a, the same people who elected Youngkin also elected her and they they elected a Cuban American for attorney general. So it's, it's clearly not about white supremacy, but they can't let go of that narrative and let them let them run with it. And, right. And, because and, it's, simply, it's clearly not true. History says in, in Virginia, too, that the attorney general is usually whoever serves as attorney attorney general is usually the strongest position to become the next nominee for governor. That, that's been true in recent years. That was true in Cuccinelli, Ken Cuccinelli's uh, case. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep in mind here. But I think also just just looking at this as it relates to Georgia more specifically, because I do think, yes, Virginia, is it, it going to be a huge bellwether, 60 plus seats? I'm, I'm not so sure. I think a lot of things, that depends on a lot of things. Yep. That said, um, it does make Republicans in in trending purple states, if not purple already states like Georgia, yep. breathe a little bit easier. That's yep. that's with a huge caveat, though, because there's so much fracturing inside the Georgia Republican Party right now. Well, I think we have to become the party of our message, really, and not the party of a personality. And yep. I know there are people who want to score points and, and exact revenge for whatever weird reason. It doesn't help the country. It doesn't help our state. Um, and it doesn't help where we're going to go together if we can't get beyond that and look forward. So I, uh, we, we've said this enough times now. It's like we have to begin looking forward. And whoever our nominee is going to be for whatever position, whether it's U.S. Senate, if it's Herschel Walker or uh, Latham Sadler or Gary Black, whoever that is, they need to be able to cast that forward vision forward-looking vision that differentiates us from what is obviously off the rails nationwide. I mean, the exit polling 
for Joe Biden was terrible. You know, this is, you know, a lot of people are looking at this as a referendum on, on that national agenda. And, uh, you know, Joe Manchin, like he said earlier, I think he has all the ammunition he needs to go back and say, look, you know, I need to save you from yourselves. And, and what a unicorn he is at this point. So qu- question uh, related to this, because we also had New Jersey, which uh, looks like Murphy, the Democrat, is going to hold on very Barely. nearly. <laughs> Barely. Um, so you, you had two in Virginia. Biden won Virginia by about 10 points. Obviously, he carried uh, no, nobody expected this the new jersey governor's race to be close and it was incredibly close um also pointing out that the that the republican nominee in new jersey defeated two very pro-trump uh candidates to win that primary and he himself was not a pro-trump candidate so just pointing that out that's another factor you got to win in there if you're going to gain you you don't have to suck up to trump but all of that happening does that what impact does that have? Do you guys think on Stacey Abrams? Does she does she look at that and say, "Oh, this is not the year for me, man"? I think that's exactly right. I think she looks at Virginia and says, uh, "I'm going to save my 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 powder and keep it dry for a presidential bid." The only thing, the only caveat is it goes back to that that fracturing inside the Republican Party. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the only thing. If if there's a if there is a credit, and I'm not talking about Vernon Jones, but if there's a credible primary right. challenger like a David Perdue, who we discussed last right. week, who can come in and damage Kemp bad enough, then you have an then you have a, a an avenue to come in and win. Because honestly, Kemp- at this point, if David Perdue runs, it's only because he's trying to destroy the Republican Party's uh, chances of winning. I I am not. I am not debating. That's a that is a separate debate from what I'm talking about. That's, yeah, that, I know. I know. Yeah. I, but, but I want to be on record as saying that sure, many times. <laughs> sure. No, I, I and I understand that. If I were a Republican, I'd be saying the same thing. But the the but but if Kemp, if Purdue comes in, who I mean, Purdue is wealthy enough where he could probably independently finance his campaign. He's going to make Kemp spend some of that war chest he's built up. So right. Kemp's going to have to replenish that uh, going into November. And I'm sure he'd win, and Purdue would sa- suffer another loss at the hands uh, at, at the hands of an opponent. But you know, it would it would put make per- uh, Kemp a lot more vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, I thought for a long time that Abrams wouldn't run for a variety of reasons, but uh, you know, she has the luxury that other Democrats don't, which is she can wait till February to announce and and be and be fine. She's got the grassroots support. She's got the money. And so she can wait and see. To to your point, Jason, is is Kemp able to, you know, coalesce, consolidate? Uh, you know, are they are the Republicans going to have a good legislative session that sets them up well f- with a bunch of good issues to run on? You know, so she can sit back and wait and watch that. But yeah, I just that that was just one thought I had. Is oh, this this may, you know, this is not something that would, you know, look at a lot of you know a lot of Democrats and say, yeah, let's jump out there and run for something. <laughs> Scott, I'm gonna give you the last word here. I want to move on. Sure. Uh, just uh, honestly, um, I, even if Purdue does get in, honestly believe that Kemp pulls it out, but he would be extremely damaged. Um, I think every day that Stacey Abrams waits, and I hate to disagree with Buzz, but I disagree with him. I think every day that she waits weakens the Democrats' chances. It, you know, it, because if she waits until February and says, "I'm out." Oh, well, they're then screwed. Yeah, they're they're, screwed they're totally that. they're totally screwed. So she either has to make a decision now um, and let people know that she's she's in or out. Otherwise, right. the Dems will the Dems have no chance. Uh, you know, the governor's record continues to be very strong. His economic numbers are very strong. He's he's making the rounds. He was on Cudlow the other day. He did fantastic job there explaining why he's made the decisions that he has made and how it has benefited every Georgian. So that message continues to resonate. Uh, you know, I, I think the Democrats are going to have a, a, a tough road to hoe unless Stacey Abrams. And if she do, if she waits, they have almost a zero percent chance. Almost. So one thing I want to go into here is is a little bit of discussion about how this is um, how this is playing in more nationally, particularly in Congress, because, you know, we've had this budget reconciliation discussion going on since what the end of July. Well, yeah. the discussion has been happening longer than that, but the actual right. legislative movement on it has been happening since July uh, or the tail end of July. And I think uh, those of us who observe national politics and congr- specifically federal uh, the Congress are wondering what the hell Democrats are doing, because there, there was so much that was said um, in, the, in some of the news reports that came out beforehand. It's like, well, dem- voters aren't realizing the benefits of Democrats and control. It's like, 
Well, they passed a $2 trillion budget reconciliation bill in February, like with a bunch of giveaways, including additional <laughs> checks, things like that. Like, yep. so what are you talking? I mean, sure. Yeah. Like that was a blatant giveaway, but like voters, the thing that, and so now Democrats are saying, well, we got to pass another bill. That's, that's 1.7 trillion, which the true cost of which is substantially more. And I'll, I can explain why, uh, but it's like, well, so November of next year, I mean, that's a year away. Yeah. And, and voters don't remember what you did back in February. And you're, you think that passing this now is something they're going to somehow remember it during the midterms next year. They're not going to care. No. The, the, th the thing politicians don't seem to realize is the electorate has a very short term memory. And, and, I, you know, I mean, yeah, there are, there are voters who are going to remember certain things, you know, particularly the, the politicos in certain party primaries, like you know, the aforementioned Brian Kemp, mm -hmm. you know, so that and a lot of that's stupid. But the I, mansion, mansion and cinema had been slowing the roll on this for a long time. Cinema is somewhat backed off. Mansion's still out there saying, guys, we need to slow down here. Like we, we don't we don't we don't need to keep forging ahead like nothing's wrong. Like look at Virginia. And I think he's right. And there, he's not yeah. the only one. There's a lot of moderates saying the same thing, including Spanberger in Virginia seven, including uh, Carolyn Bedreau in, 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 in Georgia seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so and the, and they're rushing now. Pelosi, they had a rules committee me meeting yesterday where they had all the committee chairs and ranking members and subcommittee chairs and uh, ranking members come up and talk about the bill. They debated the bill because uh, they want to put it on the floor. If not tonight, they want to put it on the floor tomorrow. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Well, where are our, yeah, our definitely Georgia not delegation? Tonight. Yeah, I mean, is Bordeaux voting for that? Uh, is she against it? What's she going to do? I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know yet. I haven't, I haven't seen specifically what she's saying. But she's one of the the, the nine moderates who's who's been you know raising the most uh, the most concerns about this thing. And the thing is, like they've they've changed the bill from what from what the committees marked up. They changed it. And they're they're like redoing the revenue portions of it now. It raises two point one seven five trillion dollars over the next ten years, and you know it like it's supposed to spend one point seven five trillion. But the 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 thing is like they're going to keep making tweaks and tweaks and tweaks, and nobody knows what they're voting on. It's a two that almost a twenty one hundred page piece of legislation, at least yeah. as currently written as of right. yesterday. You know, so it's why just, would, I mean, yeah, what you, there's no way if, if you're Carolyn Bordeaux or any of these others who are in in swingy districts, there's, there's no way you commit one way or the other until you know what's in that bill. Yeah, you know, I mean, right. you talk about what's important to you, you talk about what your priorities are, et cetera. You don't commit to a bill because there is no bill. Well, I mean, uh, uh, and not to cut it short, but I think this is a great segue because of the redistricting that's going on that well, Carolyn Bordeaux will probably be in a district that's more favorable to her than some of the other more liberal members of the of the georgia delegation hold hold that thought because one thing i do want to know here in in and when i mentioned that this bill was going to cost more than it actually is that's yeah. because a lot of these provisions that these provisions that they're some of the some of them they're extending uh like the the uh the uh, enhanced affordable care act uh, affordable uh, the affordable care act premium tax credits the uh expanded salt deduction those things are temporary, but they're Democrats or whoever's in Congress is well, presumably Democrats, if they have control at the time, they're going to want to extend those out past past when they expire. So that means the cost of the bill is going to become more expensive. And I guarantee you they'll do it through budget reconciliation if they have both chambers in the White House. So th this bill, yes, 1.75 may be the cost, but there's a lot of budgetary gimmicks to get there. Yeah. But back to Scott's point about about redistricting. Yes, we, we know that the Georgia General Assembly is back in session as of yesterday. Uh, and they are <laughs> and they are currently debating the Scott the, has his popcorn for you uh, audio viewers Scott has pulled out his gigantic bin of popcorn to watch uh, the proceedings in the house and senator uh, so <laughs> we we know that uh, we've they've released the state house and state senate maps uh, congressional maps I haven't seen yet I don't know if they've been released all I know is I've been moved into a new senate district by the by the looks of it and I'm looks like I'm staying in the same house district so there's that but uh, I mean this always makes for an interesting, interesting uh, uh, time of, I guess, on a ten-year basis. Uh, and you're right, Scott. The the the, the belief is that um, Bordeaux uh, is gonna is gonna come out of this in a, a safer Democratic district where McBath is is gonna be put into a, a very tough re-election scenario, uh, in what is becoming a very 
a very interesting six district primary race uh who she's up against i don't know but jake evans looks looks like the front runner right now at least from my form where i'm sitting um i don't megan know hansen, I, uh, megan hansen uh, we should mention has uh recently released a, a pretty good list of former colleagues from the house uh who who uh, have backed her so she's got some uh, momentum and support there too yeah so scott you've been following this a lot more than i have I, well buzz you have too but because you guys are, are more local politicos than I yeah. am. So what are you guys seeing? Uh, so one of the things that was interesting was uh, yeah, we, my phone went off. I had several calls after the caucus meeting uh, uh, Tuesday afternoon where the caucus leadership and the majority uh, leadership uh, showed the maps. Members of the, of the House majority caucus were not allowed to carry their cell phones into that meeting. They had to put them in plastic baggies with their names written on them, and they were given back to them when they left the room, <laughs> which was weird because only a couple hours later, the maps were released for the general public. <laughs> and um, if you're savvy at all, you can go to the House reapportionment website, and you can see the files for yourself. You can look at the PDF file, but it, it's not going to tell you what the street level view is, but you can download Google Earth for free, and you can take the GIS shape file information and load that into... Um, load that into the uh, software and you'll see street view. And if you type in street addresses, you can see which district that street address is in. And so I spent some time yesterday looking at who was in whose district um, and trying to figure out who's, uh, uh, who's been drawn in with somebody else who's a sitting legislator. Um, the Democrats, it's not as easy on the Democratic side, but on the House side, we had uh, several. Uh, Matt Dollar and Sharon Cooper were drawn in together. Uh, the, you know, we haven't heard from Matt about this, but the rumor is that he will be retiring. Uh, that is a rumor. Uh, again, we have not heard from Matt about that. So um, big caveat there, he could change his mind or he hasn't publicly announced that it's one of the two. So um, Sharon Cooper, Matt Dollar drawn together. Uh, Cobb County is harder for Republicans than it used to be. Um, K. Kirkpatrick goes up into Cherokee County, which I think is probably a misalignment of her political. She's far more moderate, especially for the part of Cherokee County that she's been drawn into. You're going to be my state senator, Senator Kirkpatrick. Congratulations on that. <laughs> um, uh, Brandon Beach ended up getting a huge chunk of Cherokee County, which would solidify him uh, probably. But there is a, a guy who was running for the 14th which was half a Cherokee County represented by Bruce Thompson, who has over half a million dollars in the bank, a guy named Jason Dickerson, who's interested in running for, and has announced he's running for state Senate, has a, a full-blown campaign with a half a million dollars in the bank already, uh, and is independently wealthy, owns a huge trucking company out of Cartersville, Georgia. So good luck to Brandon Beach. Um, see where you end up uh, uh, after facing a guy that has un unlimited funds. I, I know he's done that in the past, but I think this guy is probably more serious of a candidate than others have been in the past. Um, but the, you know, when you talk about who's been really like screwed and who's doing the screwing, there's a guy named Dominic Laricchia. Now you may know Dominic because he was a floor leader for governor Kemp. Um, he announced earlier this year um, that he wanted to run for caucus chairman against uh, Bonnie Rich. Now, I'm not trying to call anybody's character into question here. Uh, Bonnie Rich is the chairman of reimportionment. And when the districts came out, somebody in South Georgia was going to have to bite the bullet. They're going, they were going to have to run against somebody else. Uh, that's just the nature of where the population is in the state now. They were going to have to be drawn in together. But Dominic was drawn into a district. Um, his new district only includes the precinct where he lives in his current district and with one of his close friends, uh, Representative James Burchett. So that's interesting uh, just because of the optics of that. I don't know if anybody's talking about it or not, but it's, it's really apparent that there's something going on there. Uh, there's, there is a there there. Uh, while you've been talking, I've been looking at the congressional maps on Google Earth because I had not seen them yet. I'm still in Georgia's fourth congressional districts. Thanks for nothing, guys. Well, so, that's the Senate, the right? That's the Senate. You still have hope with your House member. You could go because this, the House is not released. And we've been told that those Senate maps, quote unquote, were drawn in crayon. Um, 
and are not going to look that way. Can That's you just sh- can you just shift can you just shift it a little bit west of Highway 81? <laughs> I mean, no. it's, that's all I gotta say. Uh, Buzz, you got any thoughts? Well, I, I was just um, the AJC did a preliminary analysis of the maps, the House and Senate maps, and mm-hmm. they based on 2020 presidential votes in the proposed districts, <laughs> the uh, House maps would create 97 districts that lean Republican, 83 that would trend uh, a lean Democrat. Currently, there's 103 Republicans and 76 Democrats. So it's a seven to six, six uh, yeah. vote swing there. In the Senate, uh, it creates 33 districts that lean Republican, 23 that lean Democrat. So there's currently there are 34 Republicans. So it's a, a loss of one. And, and I, you know, so <clears throat> there's, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of pressure, uh, pressure points in both these maps because the population is, is uh, the, po- the population is trending to away from South Georgia toward North Georgia and even in North Georgia toward Metro Atlanta. Metro Atlanta is drifting away from Republicans. Uh, so th- there's a lot of pressure there to try to draw maps that maintain a majority. But there's there's quite a few, you know, uh, Scott, you mentioned one. There's quite a few uh, other districts around the state. I haven't had a chance to look at all of them and see exactly where each uh, each representative w- lives. But there's several uh, incumbents drawn <laughs> paired together. So that's... Yeah. Um, that's, well, the that's, Democratic side, I haven't really done a whole lot of deep dive on that, but uh, I think we'd be remiss if we also didn't uh, mention what was happening in Coweta County, uh, which is traditionally a, a Republican stronghold where Philip Singleton, who took over for uh, another right uh, leaning Republican, a conservative Republican, David Stover, when uh, they they both were sort of viewed as maybe questionably troublemakers. I I, I hate I ref, I I'm hesitant to use that word because I probably was a troublemaker too. Um, <laughs> and so I don't want it to be like a negative connotation, but you know, they get, people get labeled. Right. And so David, I uh, think Stover and, and Philip Singleton both have been labeled that way fairly or unfairly. Other people can decide. And Phillips, uh, very Republican district is now a democratic district. So he's been drawn in with a Democrat. <laughs> um, uh, and Gerald he, Green, um, Gerald, Gerald Green, the, Longtime Democrat, then longtime Republican, uh, drawn in with uh, Democratic Win- Winford Dukes. Do you think so. Gerald will stay a Republican? I think that's an unfair yeah. question. <laughs> no, I think I think he would. I mean, why would you? I mean, he's if if you want a oh, he's um, shown that he'll flip back and forth already. Yeah, so if you, um, if you want a chairmanship, if you want to maintain your chairmanship, you stick with the majority. So yeah. But then if, I mean, if, if the house flips, then you go and negotiate a. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not even one of the one of the seats that you <laughs> talked about earlier. You know, the house is the house leadership is giving away five seats, six seats. Yeah. And that's not one of them. That's a competitive district. Right. So you have a potential for losing seven seats automatically come next November. Um, and now you're talking about a, a 97 number majority and you you just can't afford to have anybody get out of line at that point right i mean right. You're, you're getting to a point where you can no longer tell people their bill is dead just because you are mad that they said something in a local newspaper that you didn't agree with which happens all right. the time so cha- yeah. cha- go ahead buzz no that, that no i just agree with scott that's and but it's interesting i remember years ago um um representative ed setzler one of the more conservative guys in the house was telling me that you 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 know he's 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 a very smart dude kind of a student of history that in general republican majorities do more conservative things when they have smaller majorities and at that time we were we had a a a, a veto proof I mean, a constitutional we we could have in the house passed constitutional amendment without a single democratic vote at that time as Setzer was telling me this so i mean that'll be it'll be interesting to see how these dynamics play out does that you know, uh, shrinking in size, uh, does that cause more unity at a time when Georgia is purplish and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the, uh, you know, who the governor's going to be and, you know, do they lose any other seats unexpectedly? I mean, you would, you would expect it to be a good year for Republicans next year, but we don't know. Does Ralston know how to, I mean, this may be an unfair question, but does Speaker Ralston know how to 
lead in a group where he can't just write people off? Has he ever had that experience? I mean, or has it, has his, has his majorities always been huge, you know, and, and then him for him to give away five seats as well I, is sort of problematic. I can't remember when he was elected to the legislature, but since he's been speaker, no. Right. So he's, I mean, you, you he's going to have to adjust his leadership style is what I'm sure. saying. You know, you know, he's not going to be able to hold up, up somebody's bill for, for a really petty or small reason anymore. He's, he's going to have to, be more receptive to people who don't agree with him 100 percent of the time well and thus thus you draw singleton david clark is retiring and going away you don't have to worry about him anymore uh you draw singleton out of his district and so in in ralston's mind troublemakers are headed out the door and he has a caucus that he can manage a lot better but he's creating more troublemakers in a way when you draw somebody like a dominic rickia into a district with somebody else and only give him one precinct from his own old district and that's not sitting well with uh, with a, a large portion of the sure. South Georgia yeah. delegation. And there, there were, I mean, there, uh, thinking back on what happened in 20, 2011, um, this, uh, Jason Spencer, uh, who was a freshman who got elected at the same time I did down there in, from St. Mary's, was drawn in with Mark Hatfield, who was a constant thorn in Speaker Ralston's side. Uh, they were drawn into a district together. It, it worked out because... Uh, they didn't primary each other. Uh, Hamilton uh, Hatfield ran on, went and ran off for the Senate and did not win, but uh, that sorted itself out. And but Spencer remained a uh, an outspoken person uh, uh, and bef long before uh, before Borat showed up, especially uh, on pre premium television. <laughs> yes, but um, you know there were other there were a couple others. I'm trying to remember there were there were a couple other Republican incumbents drawn together. And then, uh, uh, but there, there seems to be a lot more this time. And that's, so that's, that's a, that's a change. That's interesting. I, I, I mean, I, like I said, I haven't had a chance to examine the democratic side to see what, um, who might've been drawn in together. As I recall, uh, in 2011, only Scott Holcomb and Elena Parent were drawn together and Elena decided not to run. And then a couple of years later, of course, she, she, uh, uh, wound up in the Senate. So. So before we've, we've, we've talked about this for, for a minute and we need to, we have a couple more, well, at least one more thing to discuss before we, we call it a night and we're button up on an hour. Uh, one casualty from Tuesday night is Kasim Reed's political career. Yes. <laughs> uh, he finished, he finished third, third <laughs> in his, his bid for uh, mayor of Atlanta uh, and uh, did not make the runoff. Uh, so RIP Kasim Reed's political career. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 I found that interesting. I'm mean, talking to people that I knew in Atlanta, even, even some Democrats, the assumption was, I mean, Kasim came into this race right off the bat, raised a million dollars, you know, very publicly announced I'm back and, uh, he's not back. <laughs> it's, and the voters had different ideas and, and, and look, it, it, you all along, the assumption had been that the current political situation with the rise in crime and concern about crime in the city and, and that this played definitely in a Kasim's hand. He was promising, you know, to hire a bunch of new police officers and strengthen the police uh, force, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have to assume that, uh, you know, the U.S. Attorney B.J. Pack putting a, quite a few of Kasim's former uh, Kasim administration officials in prison had a little something to do with that. Yeah. Uh, Felicia Moore. So you have a, you have a runoff between Felicia Moore, who, as far as anybody knows, has no problems with the law, versus uh, Andre Dickens. I may have the did I have the name right, Andre Dickens. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he 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 too has uh, some issues. There's the um, some law enforcement folks sniffing around some of his activities. Uh, so it, it'll, it'll be an interesting runoff, but it certainly seems like Felicia Moore uh, is on her way to being mayor of Atlanta. And it's, it, what's interesting about that is uh, Democrats attempted to use against her the fact that she met with a number of Republicans and had a uh, had a meet and greet with them. Uh, so there are there are Republicans in Atlanta. I know it's hard to believe, but there are Republicans in Atlanta. Many of them are active in the Fulton County Republican Party. And quite a few of them held a uh, meet and greet for her. 
the the uh, the the MAGA world tried to uh, attack them over that, uh, and then of course Democrats tried to attack Felicia Moore over that. But to me, it spoke you know it, uh, to me it spoke well of Felicia Moore that she's willing to sit down and listen and talk to any citizen of the city of Atlanta, whether whether she, she agrees with them politically or not. She's willing to sit down and talk with them. So yeah, hopefully that portends well. I mean, as a liber- as a uh, as a Republican state house rep, I would go sit with anybody that wanted to meet. Um, yeah. It didn't matter if you wanted to invite me to your group to speak to you and ans- answer questions um, from your political point of view. It didn't matter. And uh, if, if the Democrats had ever invited me to go, I would have gone. If the Libertarians had ever invited me yeah. to go, I would have gone. Um, they both just ran candidates against me instead. But OK, um, you <laughs> I, know, but I would still look- go. I met. Uh, show I mean, me, show it, me on the doll where the libertarian touched you, Scott. <laughs> Here. <laughs> he pointed to his heart. The libertarians <laughs> broke his heart. <laughs> now, but that being said, probably not good politics for Felicia Moore to meet. Uh, you know, meet maybe after the election. Maybe maybe send so you know, meet at the Waffle House at 2 a.m. To, to talk about how she's willing to listen because, you know, it's going to be used against her. It's always, you know, yeah. Democrats use this against, you know, Mary Norwood famously yeah. was hammered numerous times. Oh, I remember Keisha, allegedly being a Republican. She wasn't. Ke- but. Keisha, Lance, Keisha Lance Bottoms, if I recall correctly, was accused of being like not necessarily a Trump supporter, but at least being sympathetic to Trump, if I recall correctly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which is absurd. But, yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I think we're out of time. Uh, we're, I think we're clocking at just under an hour or just over an hour. So uh, folks, make sure you download, like, subscribe. Again, we're now on Spotify podcasts. We're always, we've been on Apple podcasts for a while. Uh, Going to get us on Google podcasts if I haven't already. Uh, and we'll have this up on YouTube uh, as well. So uh, any final thoughts, you beautiful clowns? <laughs> when Republicans stay on message, and make it a make a campaign about issues that are important to people they win yep that's a that's a good and then just i can't wait to see i won't be able to make it down there against too much work to do but tomorrow the victory parade for the braves many atlanta area schools have canceled school there's gonna it's it's gonna be a madhouse it's gonna be beautiful it's gonna be fun to see that's why i will not be within 50 miles of it (laughs) <laughs> All right, folks, y'all have a good rest of your week. We'll see you. We'll see you soon. Uh, I, I don't think I've told the guys this, but I'm not going to be around next week. So they either can skip or host. The, they can do the podcast. That Party own, time. Excellent. Their own, their own damn selves. So we can talk about all the things we love. Th- th- there you go. <laughs> That's a four letter word. Assholes. Uh, all right. Peace out. Have a good day. Have a good night. Good week. All the things. Bye, y'all. Later.